In today's recording, I want to talk about the electrolysis lab or the electrolytic determination of equivalent mass. And the goal in this particular lab is to use the technique of electrolysis, which you learn in your electrochemistry chapter, to determine the equivalent mass of an unknown metal. So electrolysis, as you learn in lecture, is the use of an electric current to cause a non-spontaneous redox reaction to take place. And we've discussed the idea of equivalent mass in a prior lab, where it's a mass that you measure of a substance in proportion to the moles of another substance that original substance contains. So for example, just to make things a little easier to understand, if I want to know the equivalent mass of an acid that's being titrated with sodium hydroxide, I can calculate it using the mass of the acid divided by the moles of the H+, plus, which comes from the acid that reacts with the NaOH. So the H plus is part of the acid itself. If you want to do the equivalent mass of the metal using these electrolysis or redox reaction, the way you're going to do it is you're going to take the mass of the metal and you're going to divide it by the moles of the electrons because the metal contains electrons in them. So that's what we're trying to calculate. And typically we do these kind of equivalent mass calculation when we don't really know the exact identity of the acid or the metal or whatever it is that you're trying to calculate. So for example, when we were doing the titration experiment with an unknown acid, we don't really know whether that acid is a monoprotic, diprotic, or triprotic acid. So that's why we use this measure of equivalent mass of the acid to determine the identity of the acid. If we happen to know what kind of acid it is, we can actually calculate the molar mass of the acid, which is just the mass of the acid divided instead of by moles of H+, plus, it will just be divided by the moles of the acid. So similarly, in the case of the metal, we don't really know what kind of metal it is. So we don't know how many electrons are released when we oxidize the metal in this experiment. And as a result, since we don't really know, we just say mass of metal over moles of electrons. So if we happen to know exactly which metal it is, then we can determine the actual oxidation state of the metal. So how do we do this experiment? We need to pass current in order for the metal to be oxidized. So I'm showing a schematic of how this thing is supposed to be set up. So what you have on one side is your unknown metal, which is just labeled as M in this case. This electrode where the metal reaction happens is the anode. And as you remember from your redox discussion, anode is where oxidation occurs. So you can see here that the reaction is the metal the solid goes to a metal ion. So just a little clearer on this side. And again, that N is the number of electrons that are actually released upon the oxidation. We don't really know what it is. That's why we just symbolize it as N. Of course, redox reaction can't happen just one half of it, the uh, reduction has to occur on the other side. On the cathode side, which is where reduction occurs, we have a reduction of H plus in, into hydrogen gas. So what you expect to see is that the metal is going to lose its mass, right? Because initially you have solid metal, but then it becomes aqueous when it turns into ions. And then on this side, you're going to see bubbling because you're going to see the production of hydrogen gas. Okay. The goal here is that we're going to be able to relate using stoichiometry how much gas is being produced back to the equivalent mass of the metal. Okay, And the way we're going to do that is just looking through the stoichiometry a little bit, we can see that the number of moles of hydrogen gas that you produce can then be connected to how many electrons you are actually making right? by that 2 to 1 stoichiometry between the electron and the gas. And once we know the number of moles of electrons, we can then say that the same number of electrons is being produced on the metal side, on the anode side. And so the mass of the metal divided by the moles of the electron should give us our equivalent mass. If you happen to know the identity of the metal, you can calculate not just the equivalent mass, but you can also calculate the oxidation state of the metal. So figuring out that number N that we wrote here in the oxidation reaction. For example, if I were to tell you that the metal itself is copper, you can find the molar mass. And the molar mass of the metal is just the mass of the metal over the moles of electron. This, of course, is our equivalent mass. And then if, if I want to convert the equivalent mass to the molar mass, I'm going to have to multiply it by the moles of electrons divided by the moles of metal. 
which is just saying how many electrons is going to be released when the metal is oxidized. That's the end that accompanies these oxidation reactions. So then if I want to calculate N, if I want to calculate the oxidation state, I can just take the molar mass of the metal divided by the equivalent mass of the metal. We'll do an example of this in a second, but first I want to show you how to calculate the equivalent mass once you get the experimental data. So here's an example. You run an electrolytic cell that produces this much hydrogen gas, and then you determine that during the experiment you lose 0.233 grams of your metal. You measure the temperature of the experiment and the pressure, and then you collect that gas underwater at that same temperature, and you're being asked first to calculate the equivalent mass of the metal. And then later on, you're also being asked to calculate the oxidation state of the metal, assuming that it's copper. So to calculate the equivalent mass, all we need to do is start with the ideal gas equation. Again, we're producing hydrogen gas in this case. So PV equals NRT. We're trying to figure out the number of moles of hydrogen gas that's produced, which is N. Uh, and N, of course, is just going to be PV over RT. Now, one important idea that you want to remember from your first semester of general chemistry is that when we collect a gas underwater, the gas that's collected is mixed with water vapor in that container because water itself produces some quantity of vapor. So if I want to know the pressure of the gas itself, what I have to do is subtract the atmospheric pressure minus the pressure of the water vapor that exists at that temperature. Where do I get this number, 23.8? All I need to do is either go to a textbook or Google it up that at 24.8 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of water is 23.8 millimeters of mercury. So once I do that calculation, I find that the actual pressure of hydrogen gas in my container is 716.2 millimeters of mercury. I then do my PV over RT here. Again, keeping in mind that for gases, you want your temperature to be in Kelvin. You want your pressure in this case to be in atmosphere because you're using the gas constant. So once you do that calculation, this is the number of moles of hydrogen gas that I collect. And to get the number of moles of electrons, I use this reduction reaction stoichiometry that I had earlier, which is two electrons for every one mole of gas produced. So converting the moles of hydrogen to electrons, I get 0 0.0072811 moles of electron. And then using that, I can calculate the equivalent mass of my metal, which is remember just the mass of the metal divided by the moles of the electron. So I get 32.001 grams per mole. That is the equivalent mass. Now remember that a follow-up question is what is the oxidation state of the metal if the metal ends up being copper? So once you find the equivalent mass of the metal, you can just take, as this equation tells you earlier, the molar mass of the metal divided by the equivalent mass of the metal. So the molar mass of copper, we can look up the periodic table, find that it's about 63.5, and then we divide that by the equivalent mass value that we just got. If you look through and analyze the units, you notice that what you get in the end is just the moles of electron over the moles of copper, which of course tells you how many electrons are released upon the oxidation of copper. In this case, it's 1.99, which rounds to two. So therefore, the oxidation state of the copper in this case is plus two.